us get that praise and the worship. Because that means, that means that we still have purpose. That means that we still have something to do for him in this earth. God is good. God is good. Lord, we praise you and we worship you, Father God. In spite of everything that we're going through, Lord, we trust you and our worship will declare that you are good. Amen. Amen. And give God a hand clap of praise. And praise is what we do. Praise is how we fight our lives. Praise is how we worship and bless our God. Amen. 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 Wasn't worship good? Ooh, those, those songs just stirred up a certain type of presence from God. Amen. 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 Then, now let's carry that same presence over to the offering. Amen. Amen. It's time to worship in our giving. Amen. Amen. It's time to bless God with what He has already blessed us with. Amen. That is our tithes and our offering. Amen. And now um, there are multiple ways to give. There are multiple ways to give. We have several ways to give. We can give in person today, here today, live and direct. Then we also have the virtual ways of giving. That is Giblify.com forward slash Rainbow River Bible Church and or Trevor Johnson Ministries. Then we have uh, Cash App T Johnson Speaks. Eleven is the Cash App. Then we have we also have a mailing address to mail your tithes and your offering is. Amen. Please, please now, now, now please let me know this. When, when you mail, please don't mail cash. Please, please mail a check. Please mail a cashless check and or a money order. Amen. That mailing address is 3455 Elm Avenue, apartment 103, Long Beach, California, 90807 is the mailing address, amen. amen. Now, as we give, let's prepare our hearts and minds to give unto God in which way he's already blessed us with, amen. And let's get our minds ready to receive the word of God, amen. amen. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we bless you and we honor you for today, Father God. Thank you for putting, Father God, seed in our vineyards, Father God. Thank you for, for blessing us tremendously, Father God. And God, we will be careful to honor you with the substance in which God blessed us with, Father God. We will give you, Father God, what you deserve, Father God. And even more because you are worthy of that, Father God. Father God, I ask that you touch your heart in this place, Father God. That you just move upon their hearts, Father God, to just give in a sacrificial, supernatural way, Father God. Knowing that you will supply all of their needs, Lord. Knowing that you will meet us where exactly where we need you, Father God. So we thank you now, Father. God, we, we are ready for the word, Lord God. I pray that you soften the hearts and the minds and the spirits of your people, Father God, to receive what you have spoken to your servant, your shepherd of this house, Lord. May we receive a rainbow word, Father God, ready to set us into this week that we are going through, Father God. Help him now. Speak to him now, Lord. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. 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 Now, please receive our pastor, Trevor Jackson.
Bible verse 3 or something like that. He talks to humanity about humanity in the sight of God. And then he turns and talks to the Jews. God shows him people. And he talks to them. And he, he, he comes with indictments against all of us. And so people don't like to really deal with Romans because it is the Romans that Paul addresses and talks about sin. sin. He talks about the law. He talks about revelation. He talks about justification. He talks about propitiation. He talks about salvation. All in Romans. And you'll find that in these days, people like to hear what they're going to get from God. Oh, you know, you know, uh, uh, but we like to hear about what we're going to get from God, not what God requires from us. Amen. But Paul deals with that and he deals with it on every level. So that there is no excuse. And today we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and I want to try and show you some things from God's perspective. And I was always taught in preaching, I was taught by some professors in preaching that in your presentation, to be effective, you want to have one foot in your presentation in the problem and the other one in the solution. That's what Paul does. He has one foot in the problem. He presents the problem, and then he presents the solution. So, tell your neighbor today, the pastor's going to talk about the problem and the solution. You know, some people just like to bring up the problem. You ever hear when somebody just likes to talk about the problem all the time? Uh, if you go talk to me about a problem, then you could bring some solution with you. That's even in my management style, that's how I like to manage. When employees come to my office and want to talk about the problem, I ask them, what, well, what do you think the solution is? But don't just come with the problem. Let's work this out together. In a relationship, that is a, that is a good, good uh, principle to operate by. If you're going to bring the problem you're having, then let's talk about the solutions also. But don't just come with the problem. Some people love to focus on the problem and stay in the negative. If you stay in the negative, you'll never get to the positive. And so Paul makes this presentation as he talks about both the problem and the solution. And so I'm going to attempt to do that in the teaching this morning. But we begin, begin in Romans 8, the first chapter of Romans. Romans, I mean, I'm sorry, Romans 1. Romans 8 is one of my favorites, so we'll go there too. Romans 1, chapter 1. And then we're going to jump to Romans 8. So we're going to jump from Romans 1, actually get into Romans 5. I hope I keep going to Romans 8. <laughs> Romans 1 and then Romans 5. So in Romans 1, verses 18 through 23 is what we'll focus today. And some of you, if you've been here in the last couple of weeks, you've been watching online the last couple of weeks, you'll know that we talked about uh, Romans 5 in the last couple of weeks. And when I read it, it will sound familiar. I'm reading this from the New Living Translation. Romans 1, beginning at verse 18, it says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress, I'm about to say suppress, suppress. who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he, watch this, has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. All right. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. Right. Watch this. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Verse 21 says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Verse 22 says, claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. Yes, sir. Wow. But let's not 
say there is a problem. Let's go to the answer. Let's go to Romans 5. And then I'm going to come back and deal with all of this. Romans 5, beginning at verse 8. Now notice the condition of man and notice their behavior. It would be justifiable if God would just again or that God wiped all of mankind out. It would be justifiable because now he is angry and deal with his anger and then. But even though he is angry, he is still in love. Anybody ever been in love? You get angry with you. Y'all you know, won't be for it. Well, Romans 5. Let me give you the word now. Beginning in verse 8. But God showed or demonstrated his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of he will certainly save us from God's condemnation or judgment. Amen. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemy, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Hallelujah. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship. Somebody say relationship. Amen. With God. Because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. And may I add, not just friends, but he's now made us sons and daughters of God. So I want to talk to you about from this, this subject matter. From anger to love. Or from rejection to relationship. Yeah, it's heavy. It's heavy. It's heavy. Uh, uh, it, it, from anger to love. And from rejection to relationship. God has, has, has made a way for him to move from his anger to his love for us. I love it too. God has made a way for us to move from rejecting him to have a relationship. That's what this whole sermon is about. And we can just shout right there. I want, I want you to think about with me and consider as I was thinking about this this week and actually for the last couple of weeks the Lord has been dealing with me on us going back to biblical basics, the pattern, the pattern. You hear me say, going back to the pattern, going back to the pattern. Uh, the pattern of the first church in Acts 2. What were they doing? What were they like? Um, you know, why was God blessing them? It's because they were following his biblical pattern. And still today, God requires his people to follow his pattern. If you're mine, follow my pattern, not the pattern of the world. And this is why Paul says in Romans verse 12, I mean chapter 12, don't conform to the world. Don't, don't start trying to look like the world. And don't bring the world's patterns up in here. This is my house, you are my people, you need to follow me my way. Uh, we gotta go back to, yes, it's good to shout, it's good to fellowship, it's good to worship, but we gotta follow God's pattern, his way, and we're gonna please him. So then the question becomes, who are we trying to please? Now we're trying to reach everybody, particularly a lost world. And so yes, there ought to be some modifications, perhaps, in how we present God. But the message remains core, the same. Amen. Amen. That God is a righteous God, that, they get, that, that, that the world at large are sinners until they accept Christ. And how we present that needs to be sensitive to the audience we're trying to reach. Yes? If you are ever in sales, you're taught the technique of presenting what you're trying to sell by first of all assessing your target audience. Yes. Yes. Target audience. Who are you trying to reach? And you package yourselves, whatever it is you're selling, in a way that shows them they need what you have. Right, right. Keep following, I'm going somewhere. Yeah. Going somewhere. Uh, uh, I gotta present and make them aware of the need before they can become interested in whatever it is I have. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Right. In fact, that's even how we date, right? right? Trying to show somebody you need me. 
How do I know that? Because we talk about what we bring to the table. Y'all don't talk to me or look at me like I'm hungry. What you bring to the table. Right? And so, and so we we want to be sensitive to who we're trying to reach. And we're trying to reach a dark world and we are the light. He said you're the light of the world. But we have to carry God's message and present it from a perspective of love and hope. Although the truth of the matter is there is also included condemnation, damnation, and judgment. There's a possibility of that if the gift is not accepted. But of course, we don't hit people and beat them over the head with a with the rod of Moses and the Bible. We want to present it in there is hope, there is love, but you do need Jesus. And so when we look at Romans, Paul is making that appeal to both the Gentiles, all humanity at large, but he's also speaking to the Jews, the chosen people who have gotten away from worshiping the God who chose them. And I believe that even though this was written many, many, many years ago, that these things are still present today. There's still a need for God to be lifted up and revealed, recognized, and received. And it is our job as the chosen people of God now to carry that message and to present that message in its truth. And so as we see Paul talking to humanity and the Jews, we can see ourselves because these things are still present today. Now, first Paul deals with, in this particular uh, a chapter, he talks about the anger of God. And, and now this, this, this takes place, he's talking about how God sees humanity, watch me now, before the call of Abraham and the choosing of the Jews. So this, this is Paul's uh, writing, and he's explaining God's perspective before Adam, uh, Abraham was called, because God calls Adam and uh, Abraham into relationship and says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations, and he calls the Jews as his chosen people. And this is before that time, God sees all of humanity the same, and it is still present for those who are lost outside of relationship uh, that God still sees humanity as sinful. So let's talk about that. So, so now God looks at all of humanity and he has condemned us because of sin. S-I-N, not mental illness. Not personality complexes. God has condemned all of humanity because of sin. God hates sin. You see it on this side. God hates sin. But he loves the sinner. I want you to make that distinction. God so loved the world. The world was sinful. But God loved the people of the world. God loved the individual of the world even though they were sinners. Because God, well, God hates his sin but not the sinner. And so and sin speaks of behavior. Somebody say behavior. behavior. Sin speaks of behavior. And God says because men sin. I hate what they do, but I love them. All right. Can you relate? Yeah. We hate sometimes what we do. Yeah. You, ever, you ever felt guilty about something you did and you say, I wish I would not have done that. Yeah. But you don't hate yourself. Right. And so God hates what we do, but he does not hate. I want to make that clear. Uh, because God is love and God does love, but he hates what we do sometimes. He hates sin. It goes against his righteous nature. Right? And so God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. And it's for this call that God initiates a way of escape. He, 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 he sees the problem, but he provides an answer. And so God looks at humanity, and, and through these verses, through these two chapters, we can see how God sees humanity and why he sees them that way. And Paul go straight forward into addressing some things, some in very particular detail. While the world is in denial, while they're in rebellion and rejection of the very God who created them, it arouses his anger. Now this word anger means judgment against someone. So, because so, we really can't handle the anger or the wrath of God. We can't 
yet. We can't handle it. And so thank God for grace and mercy. But this word, when it speaks of anger, it speaks of judgment. In other words, God has looked at us, and because of what we do, he has condemned and judged humanity to what they deserve because of what they do. Yet God cannot leave us in that situation. He must also provide an answer to the problem that he has allowed. Now watch this. God is not responsible for sin, but God has been tolerant of sin. God ain't sinning. God can't sin. God hates sin. There is no darkness in him. And so because of who he is, he cannot leave his creation who he made in his image that far from him or unlike him. We ought to shout about that. Because God says, I see the problem, so I'm going to present an answer. I'm trying to teach. And so let's go back. Let's go back to Romans 1 and look at what condition the world is in then. And let's answer the question, are they still there now? Come on up here and help me, Elder. You up back there hanging. I like that. Come on, stay up here. No, you can stay where you are. Now, in, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says, but God shows or demonstrates his anger from heaven so God is in heaven and he is observing the very man that he made and he's evaluating how we are behaving and if we are acting like him since he made us in his image or have we taken on another personality? It's bad we got to deal with people with multiple personalities. You don't know who you're going to wake up with. You don't know who, who getting up this morning, man. I hope it was who I was there with last night, but you never know. They might have had a dream. They might have had a bad night. They might have ate something bad, and, and you never know who you're going to wake up. It's good if you're waking up with the same person, and you're just the same. You're not like you see you today than you was last night. God evaluates humanity at large. He's sitting back, and he's sitting back in all of his glory, and he's evaluating how are they behaving. And it says, his anger is stirred. His anger. God shows his anger. He reveals it. He lets men know that I'm not pleased. And that moves him, because he's a just God, to judgment because of our unrighteousness. Watch what he says. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people. Why? Because number one, they suppress the truth by their wickedness. I'm teaching you. You know what it means to suppress something? Some of us have had some bad childhoods and some bad memories and some bad events that have happened to us that you're, you, you have suppressed in your subconscious. That means you pushed it down. That means you buried it. But God says here that that I have shown you the truth and you have pushed it down. You suppressed it. You buried it. How can we do that, God? By your wicked behavior. Let's make that the man. So, so he says, he says, and for that reason, God is angry with humanity because they will not acknowledge the truth that he has already revealed. Watch this. Verse 19 says, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious. Somebody say obvious. I'm really trying not to preach. I'm, I'm, I'm really trying not to preach. I'm trying to do this. Let me know my voice. They know. This word know, watch this. This word know, I, I was doing the study, and this word know means that, that there was the truth, the divine truth that was made available. So God made the truth available to humanity, but they pushed it down. In other words, they rejected it. They said, I don't want to hear that. We have it available to us, but we don't want it. You've given it to us out front, but we don't want it. Active rebellion, active rejection because God has said, here is the truth about me. I want you to get to know me. And humanity said, we don't want you. 
And we don't want to know the truth. You ever notice somebody just don't want to know it? It becomes an argument of who's right or wrong. I don't want to be right. I want the truth. And so God says, I, 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 it says, they know the truth about God, truth by association. Yeah, yeah. But they suppress it. And he has made it obvious to them. He's made it obvious to the world. Even today, God is still making the truth obvious. Woo, keep going with me. I know it's heavy. It's going to get lighter. It's going to get lighter. Verse 20 explains how he made it obvious to them. It says, for ever since the world was created, all the way back to the creation, God has been presenting the truth, presenting the truth, making it obvious, making it obvious. Yes. Ever since the world was created, people have what? Seen the earth and the sky. Yes. The New Living Translation says, God says, ever since I cre made the creation, you should already know about me because you see me with my word. I gave you the sky, I gave you the earth, I gave you the moon and the stars, so that every time you come outside, you can see me at work. And that is the truth that there is a living God, not an evolution, not an explosion, not science, but there is a divine creator that keeps the season running on time. There's a divine creator that holds the sun in the sky, orbiting around the earth. There is a divine creator that makes the moon shine at night. There's a divine creator that holds all the galaxies in place. When you look up, don't worship astrology. Worship the God who put it all in place. And I made it clear to you, I give you eyes to see it and a mind to understand it, but you keep pushing it down and suppressing it. Now you're worshiping the universe instead of the one who created the universe and that is wickedness against the righteous God. It's, it's almost like you're with somebody and you keep giving them good things, gifts, and everything they want you to, but they give credit to somebody else. Y'all feel that now? God says, I made it clear for ever since the creation, you have seen the earth and the sky. Watch this. Through everything God made, they can clearly see. Somebody say, clearly see. His invisible qualities. The, through, through all of nature, they can see and understand that there is a God who loves, there is a God who cares, there is a God who forgives, there is a God. So even if they don't come to church, even if you're on your height, you should be thinking of me. You should be able to see me and understand that there is an intelligent, loving, forgiving God that exists. So watch this. So even if you never come to church, open a Bible, been to a prayer meeting, I've given you evidence that you should know that I exist and I'm reaching for you to have a relationship with you, but you keep pushing it down. Woo! Got to deal with it. Do everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, because what other power could sustain such an ecosystem? What other power could continue to wake you up and breathe the breath of life and turn you? What other power could heal your body when the doctors can't figure it out? What other power can keep you walking and your body walks and moves in a rhythm? Your heart beats at a rhythm. Your blood flows in a rhythm. Your organs pump at a rhythm. What can keep that in place? Certainly ain't you. So are you serious? You keep pushing the truth down when I keep revealing to you that I'm real and I love you and I want you and I want us to be together, but you keep suppressing it and choosing a lie over the, you know, some people. They got to believe the lies in the truth. It says, watch this now. It goes even deeper. Through everything God made, they can clearly see. Somebody say, clearly see. Clearly see. His invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature. So, this line is an indictment. They have no excuse for not knowing God. Tell you later, there's no excuse. There is no I don't care what they say. Oh, I, I, I'm in church hurt. That ain't no excuse. Yeah. I'm going to tell you the truth today. Y'all don't have to come back after the day. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> but I'm telling you the truth. There is no excuse that is justified before our righteous God of why you won't come to him and 
to the relationship, there is no, come on, church, say on the church, there is no excuse, come on, there is no excuse, come on, there is no excuse, now, here's the other one, he broke the Bible, there is no excuse, you ain't created electricity, but you use it, man, it's pretty money, but you spend it, there is no excuse. The Bible says they have no excuse for not knowing God because he's made it clear to them that he's real and he exists. Watch this. Verse 21. Let's go deeper. Somebody say deeper. Deeper. Ooh, I feel like I feel like preaching of God. We're going to be in this world. Y'all got me? Thank God. That's your name. You got it. So you're about to get God. Now here, we're talking about the problem. This is the problem. This is the problem. Is we were in a condition that was unacceptable to God. That was then. Is that still true today? Yes, sir. Are there still people who will not receive and accept the relationship with God because they keep pushing the truth down? God says, I have a pattern and I have a purpose. And I have a way that I want you to walk with me. And if you can't do it how you want to do it, you got to do it like I say you got to do it. And this is their problem. They wanted to do it the way they, in fact, by all their behavior, sin, remember the sin behavior, they showed that they didn't want God, they suppressed his truth even though he gave it to them, and they thought that that would be an excuse. Well, I didn't know, I didn't know. How could you not know when you wake up and smell my air every day? How could you not know when you're walking along that height and you see all the green bushes and herbs growing up from, from out of the earth? How could you not know when the birds are singing my praise and crying over your head? How could you not know when the waves are rushing in while you sit at the beach meditating the waves are rushing. Who you think you can do it for? How could you not see me? How could you not hear my voice? How could you not know I exist? Why do you keep pushing the truth down? So there's no excuse. Watch this. Verse 21. Yes, they knew God. Now, I want to do the, there's, there's a couple of different Means for the word know here. We talked about in the beginning, verse, in verse 19, it says, they know the truth about God, which means that knowledge has been given to them, available, it's available for them. They have access to it. Right? But 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 they, they suppress it. They suppress it. And then here in verse 21 it says, Yes, they knew. And this means, this word means uh, knowing by association, it means that they knew about God. But then they didn't go to the deeper level of knowing, which is personal experience through the relationship. So they knew about God because he made the knowledge available for them to know it, but they wouldn't receive it because they kept pushing it down, but they still knew about him. Right? And so they said, yes, they knew God. They knew about God by acquaintance, but they wouldn't worship God as God. This is why I don't like hearing people call him the man upstairs. Let's not worship God as God, because God is not a man. The Bible tells us God is not a man, that he's your God. So if you're talking to me about God, don't refer to him as the man upstairs, because that makes him like me. But, but when you talk about God, you're going to say, the God of God, the King of Jesus. The holy and righteous God, the creator, the Yahweh, the, 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 the I am that I am. Identify which God you're talking about. He is not the man of the dead. He is not the universe. He is not the universe. He is not the
The world will not worship him as God. That's why they don't want to talk to you about God. That's why they want to keep pushing it down. Because they don't want to recognize or receive God. And the God you love is who they hate. The God you serve is who they reject. The God who keeps getting you up every morning. The God that keeps making a way out of They don't know him like that. But they don't worship him like that. They want to worship a God of convenience. But you don't know if I have time, I'll stop by your house. If, if it makes me feel good, maybe I can do it. Ooh, this walking with God is too hard. Well, we're doing it the best we can. And God doesn't ask us to do it without helping us through the Holy Spirit. They wouldn't worship God as God. Or they wouldn't even give Him thanks. But it said, and they begin to think up foolish ideas of what God is like. Have you ever had a conversation where somebody's not saved and they begin to try and reason with you about what God is, who He is, and what anybody in here? Come on, let's talk. We can have a Bible study. Oh, it bothers me. It gets up under my skin. They don't even know they're trying to explain God to me. You can't explain what you don't know. You're trying to explain God by science. But God is the God of science. God lives outside of science. God lives outside of life. I feel the Holy Spirit is playing. God lives outside of what we can understand. That's why you gotta have faith to walk with Him. Because there's a whole lot of things about God I don't understand. But I come to receive the truth. And I stand on the truth. And when I know about the truth that God has revealed to me, I'm a personal ambassador. I can talk to you about it. How he forgives sins. I can talk to you about it. how he restore your joy. I can talk to you about it. how he pick you up and turn you around. Put your feet up. I can talk to you about a God who will take somebody who deserves judgment and give him life brand new. So that he can be in Christ, be a new creature. Yes, sit down. I'm trying to see. Them re- 
rejecting the truth of God. As a result of them not worshiping God as God, their minds became dark and confused. Let me tell you something, saints. Save your energy. You will never win an argument with somebody that's confused. You will burn yourself up. You will get your high blood, your blood pressure up. You will make yourself sick trying to argue with somebody that's confused whose mind is dark. Because how many of you have no by experience? You can't change nobody's mind. That's a Holy Spirit job. That's a God job. So save your energy for worship. Save your energy for praise. Stop wasting your energy with pointless arguments. And, and that's why I don't get caught up in all this stuff about what this and this, this true and this. I ain't got time for that. I need my energy to worship what I know. I need my energy to give them the praise. Watch this. Their minds became dark and confused. 22, but they don't know it. Why? Because 22 says, claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. That's one thing to deal with a fool. It's a whole other level to deal with an utter fool. That's a whole other teaching. I ain't got time for it today. You got to know what level of fool you're dealing with. You can deal with surface fool or other fool. And the Bible says that those who won't receive God's truth, whose mind became dark, are utter fools. You ain't got the anointing to be dealing with them kind of fools. Shake the dust off your feet and take it to the next person who will be receptive. But they don't even know that they're fools because they think they're so smart. I've dealt with some people that think they're so smart. They don't went to school. They got all these degrees. They want to start comparing degrees. No, let's not compare degrees. Let's compare relationships. I, I, I may not have a degree, but I certainly got a relationship. And there's nothing wrong with education, but there's better a hope in revelation. I got the revelation that you all might not have an answer. Hey. We still talk about somebody shot the problem, the problem, the problem. Claim to be wise, they instead became our fools. And here it is. Instead of worshiping the glorious, ever living God, they worship idols made to look like people and birds and animals. And reptiles, it's called idolatry. It's called false gods. It's called idol worship. And, and what is idol worship? The Bible says that, that so they wouldn't recognize the creator as God. They wouldn't recognize the real God. They wouldn't worship him as God. But instead, they decided, they made a choice. They went with plan B to worship things they could make with their own hands. Now, I don't know about you, but if I can make it, I this would be. I can't worship it if I can make it. Now, if I can put it together, I can't worship it. Because there's going to be some stuff I go through in my life that will need somebody outside of my ability, my ingenuity, my intellect that can help me get out of. And, and, and thank God that he is the creator and I'm not. Because if I created God, I certainly couldn't run to him for help. But, but these fools don't understand that what they made can, does not have the power to help them. That's why they refer to it as good luck charm. And they worship their good luck charm. And they worship their plants. And they worship the creation instead of the creator. Because they think they're smart. And they think they got to figure it out. And they're trying to flip the script. I was online the other day and somebody was saying that those who believe in God, that's for weak people. That's for stupid people who don't have enough sense to take control of their own lives. Well, can I share my testimony? I have taken control of my own life and it got me in the mess that I almost couldn't get out of. There are people that worship the sun and the moon. There are people that worship astrology and stuff. You saw it the other day. Somebody posted this, and I thought it was one of the most profound things I saw all week. 
One of my Facebook friends posted, people will run for miles and miles to see the eclipse and the darkness, but won't go right around the corner to, to a church to see the light. And just said, let me say it again. People are coming from all across the country, across different nations, and to run to a place where they can see the darkness cover the sun. To see the darkness cover the sun, the eclipse, the darkness. And that shows you the state of the mind of the world. The Bible says men love darkness more than light. So you want to see the darkness cover the sun. Came from miles, spit gas, got on planes, paid outrageous plane payments, spent the night outside. But they won't go around the corner to the local church to see the S O N who outshines all the lies. Something is wrong with that picture. People worshiping astrology. And now you make an attempt to kill your whole family and kill yourself this morning. You heard the news. They said she worshiped astrology and she was talking about spiritual warfare. They don't understand what she means, that she was in a warfare for her soul because the enemy already had her captivated and, 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 and in prison and she was moved by this solar eclipse to the point to where she kills almost her whole family except one survivor and then kills herself. You better wake up and look and see the state of the world that we live in. Then was that true back then in Romans? Yes. Is it still true today? Yeah, we got idol worshiping. We got people worshiping astrology.
it is really going to bring us to Romans chapter 5 and we're home. Because while the problem is immense, while the problem is eternal, while the problem is something that is out of our control and bigger than us, God says, I will initiate and provide a problem because, I mean, an answer because I'm the only one who can. Since you will not accept my truth, let me see if you will accept my gift of grace. And so the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 8, but God demonstrated or God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still rejecting him. In other words, God gave us his best while we were at our works. And since those of us who have accepted him have been made right, tell you, I've been made right with God. I've been made right with God because of Jesus. But everybody can't say that because when we look at the landscape of the world, there's still a whole lot of people that will not recognize God, will not receive God through Christ, will not worship God, are not thankful to God, and still rejecting the truth that He has provided. If God didn't provide it, it ain't true. Keep on thinking man wrote the Bible and not pay attention to it and see what happens. Keep on rejecting the grace of God that we don't deserve. And your mind is confused and now the enemy's got people thinking that they can never be changed. They can never be saved. There's never a way out. So you might as well just keep living like the devil is a liar. For the Bible says that while we were still deep in our sin, God sent Jesus to die for our sin so that whoever will choose, we can come into a right relationship with God. And I don't know about you, all the cars won't do it. All the houses won't do it. All the families. Because God has condemned 
all of humanity because he's forgiven all the sin. But if the sinner will receive his gift and accept the truth of God and come into a relationship that only happens through Jesus, because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. But somebody say, he washed. He washed. He washed. Get why? So that we can now stop rejecting and come into a place of friendship with him. The Bible says, even while we were the enemies. I don't know how many of us have made a way for our enemies to become our friends. Come on, think about that. I know some of your friends went from being your friends to your enemies. But have you made a way for them to come back to friendship? The Bible says that when we couldn't do it for ourselves. And some of our friends that have become enemies now, we say this, there's nothing you can say to me. I'll never trust you. I'll never deal, I'll deal with you. Nothing you can say to me. But when God gave us Jesus, he opened up the way for us to come back and say, take me back. Listen. The Bible says in Hosea, this is another message, that when Israel turned against God and was sinned against God, God used Hosea, a preacher, to marry a prostitute who would not be faithful. And Hosea looked like a fool because every time she did, God said, Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and God told Hosea, She will never be not only was she leaving home for other lovers, she was taking gifts to her other lovers. And God said, I'm going to use your relationship to show how Israel treats me. How my people treat me. I'm good to them. I brought them out of slavery. I brought them through the wilderness. But they still won't work for me. For me. He said, but I will never give up on them. And, and, and here's what God said to Jose. It's crazy to blow your Not only did he make a way for him to come back, he said, I'm going to tell you what to say when you come back. Right. Read the story. I'm going to, he said, come Israel and bring with you words. Yes. And when you come back, here's what I need you to say to me. You are the God of our fathers. You acknowledge me. Here's what you say to me. When you, and when you come and, and when you come back and say this to me, I'm going to take you back and we'll be in one this stuff. Who do you know? He's calling us to surrender all. He's calling us 
He said, come back to me and say this when you come. I mean, he didn't even tell them what to say. Because he wants them back so bad. Yeah. We will never understand how much God loves us. But when you look at the words that grow up like enemies and strangers to God, yeah. foreigners to God, but yet Christ has made us friends of God, sons of God, daughters of God, and given us an inheritance. Yeah. Who do you know? What enemy do you have? And you will say to them, I'm going to make us friends again, and when I die, my house is yours. My car, my, all my, 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 my estate is yours. Who do you know? You don't know anybody. God indicted them, all of humanity, because of three things. I'm going to say this in the middle of the verse. These are the three reasons that God condemned all of humanity. He said, number one, they worship, number one, that they suppress the truth. I keep making it clear to them, you need a nature. They can't tell me when they stand before me, be judged, knowing I didn't know. You never show me. Yes, I am. I gave you the, I gave you natural, it's called natural revelation. Yes. Not for you to worship, but so you would know that I am. Yes. And that I am the I am that created all this. Yes. But you suppress the truth. And your sin, your behavior toward me even affected how you treat everybody else. Yes. And that is wickedness. The way you treat your brother and sister because you don't know me. You suppress the truth, you will not receive the truth. That was first. Number two is because they kept ignoring God's revelation. God kept saying, I'm revealing it to you. I'm showing you that I'm here. I'm showing you that I love you. I'm, I'm showing you that I want you. That inner voice that you hear calling you, that's me. That emptiness that you have that only I can feel, that's me. I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to show you. Uh, uh, uh. So, so because they kept rejecting the revelation, even though they could clearly see it. And then lastly, they perverted the glory of God. How did they do that? Because they wouldn't glorify him as God when they were worshiping cars and houses and, and, and astrology and false gods and plants and ice and all that stuff. Uh, when God said you should glorify me, the only true and living God, but you had made other things and people a priority. And anytime you put anything or anybody over God, that is idol worship. And we have been guilty of making other things more important than God in our life. And God says, but... That's the problem. Yeah. The answer is that I've given you Jesus. Now we will just receive him. Let's come together with the relationship. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe there's somebody here. God is calling you right now. And he's saying, I've been talking to you. I've been reaching for you. I've been showing you all through everything that's around you that I am God. And that I want relationship with you. But the only way you can come to me is through my son. There are a whole lot of other religions out there, but none of them can provide you with relationship. If that's the truth of God. And so I don't care what the world is saying. I don't care what social media is saying. I don't care what the magazines are saying. I don't even care what, what, what uh, the news and the media is saying. The Bible says there's only way, one way to God, and that is through Christ. And so if you're here in this house, and you know God is calling you to this relationship, I want you to come down this aisle right now. Everyone's praying. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. This is a serious moment because God's not going to force himself on you. You've got to choose from your own free will. you got to voluntarily say, God, I acknowledge you. I love you. I receive you. I know you've been calling me. That's the first call. Someone who wants Jesus, wants a relationship. We've been made right with God through Jesus, and you can too. I don't care how long you've been in sin. If you're watching, I don't care how long you've been in sin or what you've done. There's nothing God cannot save you from. The second call is for the backslider, those who know Jesus and know God, but maybe you've been out there doing your own thing. You've been, you, you saw yourself in these scriptures and you said, I just want to come back to God. I, I've been living in me time, but now I want to live on his time. I want to make him the priority in my life. Maybe that's you. You can come. And all it takes is us to pray and you go right back to your seat of a prayer of reconciliation. Father, I'm coming home just like the prodigal son. And you come with humility saying, I'm not asking you for payment for you. I'm just saying, Lord, restore our relationship. And the son came home and said, make me a servant if you have to. That's the kind of humility you come back to God. And the third one is, if you don't have a church family, let me tell you, 
God's order and his plan and his pattern is that you belong to a local church family where you can grow and interact and be strengthened. That's the way God set it up, and we cannot do anything that was not a way. So if you're in this house and you fall into any of these categories that God has talked to you, I need you to write down this altar right now. It's not to embarrass you. It's so that you will not reject the opportunity God has presented to you this day. If you're online, I need you to make an expression. I need to make a decision for Jesus. I want to come home. I want to join Raven Word family. I believe God has planted me there. Whatever that decision is, somebody's waiting to uh, respond to you. Our ministers are waiting. Church is waiting. Daniel, that's who's waiting to respond to you because we don't want you to miss this opportunity to give your life to Jesus. Now go to prayer. Dear Father, how we love you. We worship you. We thank you. We lift you up. We acknowledge you as the only ever living, everlasting God. Our God. Our Father. And we thank you for Jesus. Your son. Who shed his blood. That we might be saved. And I thank you for every person in this house. I thank you that you have made us right with you in Jesus. That we are no longer sinners, strangers, foreigners, or enemies. That we now stand in the power of our relationship as sons and daughters. We thank you for that. And Lord, we pray for anybody that we know, anyone in our family, our neighbors, even our enemies, who don't know you as Lord and Savior. Give us the words to speak to them. Give us the light. Give us the anointing. Then when we introduce you, they will see you, feel you, hear you, and respond to you. The only true and living God. This world is in darkness. Shine your light. Shine it through your people. The world is in trouble. But you provide a way out. Help men to turn. Help women, boys and girls to turn to the way out. Before it is ever too late. Don't let us be the people of Rome, but let us be the people of the New Testament. That if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. We thank you, Father. We love you. We will continue to lift you up. And we will walk with you according to your plan. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for forgiving us. And thank you for transforming us. We will forever be the Lord. Now, Lord, if there's anyone in this place or anyone watching, pray that before this day is over, they will make the proper decision. Save our son, save our daughter, yes, yes. save our husband, save our wives, save our household. Do it for your glory, this we pray. In Jesus' mighty name. Jesus. May somebody say amen. 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 As you sit down, uh, we're going to have our announcements, but uh, as you sit down, I want to welcome all of our visitors. I always see a few out there. I always see that nice couple. Uh, but I want to just recognize Brother Flaxen, uh, one of our connectors. Would you please stand? Just give us your name and your church home and who invited you and anything else you want to say to Brother Michael. Mike Flaxen, Philadelphia, PA. Uh, church home was Christ Union Church in
in this country right now, uh, we have just one announcement. Please pay attention and please commit yourself and govern yourself accordingly. Amen. 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 Amen.
Please don't have your hands if you don't mind. Somebody asked me for a Bible last week. Uh, I don't remember who it was, but they had a couple of questions. Uh, I don't know if it was on Wednesday night or if it was on Sunday, but if you asked me for a Bible within the last week or this week and a half, uh, please make sure I know who you are so I can get you the Bible that you asked for. Amen. Because I don't remember who it was, but uh, uh, we do have, uh, I can order this Bible, take those to you from over you. We have given it to a dad. We have a bunch now to order the Bible. And we can be here for a couple of days. So if you ask me for a Bible, it's online or what have you. But somebody walk by me and say, Pastor, I can use this study Bible. So we want to make sure you get one. Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Father, it's been a good day. We thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. We thank you for all that you've done for us and with us and through us. Thank you that as we travel the highways and the byways, you don't let us travel alone. And so for those of our friends who are still traveling, bring them back to safety, Lord. The holidays, Lord, that Evangelist T and those of them are too late to traveling, Marquisha and some others that might be traveling, bring them home safely. Bless and all those who touch all those who desire healing in their bodies, their mind, their emotions. Lord, you can do it because you are the God of healing. We still believe in your healing power. Bless all those who have need, financial, situational, relationship wise. Those of us who lead at work and are dealing with challenges, give us the answers now. Give us the wisdom to lead your people, those who lead in ministry or in the corporate world. We can pray that you continue to lead us that we might lead your people and give godly wisdom through these biblical principles. We live in a world that no longer wants righteousness or wants things to be convenient and comfortable. But Lord, we pray that you would help us to lift up your standard even in the marketplace, in our families, in our neighborhoods. We thank you, Lord, for strengthening us for such a time as this. So be our banner, be our strength, be our champion. Fight our battles. The enemy is defeated, and we have the victory. Cause us, Lord, not to walk around in the spirit of the victim. And help us to know that we are victorious. Thank you for those who partner with us, who give us prayer requests, who teach us prayer word. Uh, help us provide Bibles and ministry needs. We thank you. Bless them abundantly, exceedingly over all that they ask for. And then, Lord, strengthen us for this week's challenges, today's challenges, and whatever faces us. And we pray that you would get us through it, as you always have. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being good. 